In this lesson, we explore the idea of optimization. So what we're going to be doing is using derivatives to solve a variety of optimization problems. These are a few steps that you can follow to help you tackle these kind of problems. Um, you want to read the problem. Now, don't take that lightly. Um, you want to read the problem and read it as many times as you need to until you really understand what it's asking um, what is given information? What is unknown information? Uh, what do you want to optimize, right? So you're going to look for um, some quantity that they're asking you to optimize. A lot of times these problems will use the word maximize. That means they're looking for you to maximize um, some quantity or they'll ask you to minimize a quantity. So look for that language. Um, now, I'm no artist, but drawing a picture many times helps tremendously understand. It helps you understand what's happening. So draw a picture if you can. Introduce variables. So you're going to have to find relationships between the um, quantities that you're looking for, uh, relationships with the quantities that are given. And many times there's a formula that you're going to use or an expression that you're going to uh, use and manipulate in the problem, all right? Um, you want to write an equation for the unknown quantity. Um, now, this is important. Um, when you write this, I'm reading number four. When you write an equation for the unknown quantity, if you can, express the unknown as a function of a single variable. Okay, try your very best to get one variable only. Now, um, you may have to do a considerable amount of manipulation to make that possible, but that's going to help you tremendously. And test the critical points and endpoints in the domain of the unknown. So um, this is where a lot of our, you know, our work with derivatives come, come into play, um, identifying the critical points and so forth. All right. So these are just a few steps that I think might help us kind of map out um, how you and I will tackle these sort of problems. So let's look at our very first example now. All right. So here's our example. An open top box is to be made by cutting small congruent squares from the corners of a 12 inch by 12 inch sheet of tin and bending up the sides. How large should the squares cut? from the corners be to make the box hold as much as possible. So we have a 12 inch by 12 inch sheet of tin. Let's draw that um, square now. And maybe um, drawing the picture will help us identify what's happening in this in this problem. So here is our 12 inch by 12 inch um, tin sheet right and so this is 12 inches by 12 inches now the problem says we're cutting out corners small congruent squares from the corners and what we're going to do is we're going to bend up the side so these sides here are going to bend upward um to make a box right so that it can hold um now um the idea is that you want to hold as much as possible. So you're looking for the maximum volume. That's what you're looking for. Now, um, when you fold up these sides, um, maybe we should update our picture. Um, it might be a little hard, but when you up fold up the sides, you're going to have a box, right? And um, as far as volume is concerned... Um, the formula for the volume of a box is length times width times height. Now, when you fold up the sides, the height will be X, right? These are squares, right? These are squares on the end. So when you fold this side up, this is hard to show, but when you fold this side up, um, the height is going to be X. The length of the box right here, this much here, let me, uh, I can do this part. This length here, there. That's going to be 12 minus 2 times x, right? Because 
um, this much of, this much of X that you're taking away, right? Because you're cutting off that corner, and you're also cutting it off over here. So it's minus X minus another X. So this is 12 minus 2X. Um, likewise, um, over here, it's going to be 12 minus 2X. So then the length times the width times the height of this box, that is to say the volume, will be the length, 12 minus 2x, times the width, 12 minus 2x, times the height, times x. Let me move this up for us. So we have the volume, we can write it as a function in terms of x, will be equal to x times 12 minus 2x times 12 minus 2x. This is the formula for the volume because uh, the formula for the volume um, is length times width times height. Okay, so that's what this is. All right, so we can rewrite it. Um, we can rewrite it as v of x, the volume of this box, is x times 12 minus 2x quantity squared. All right, very good. Because eventually we're probably going to take the derivative or find the derivative, we should probably consider expanding this. So then this would be uh, 144, 12 squared is 144, 144x. And then this and here, the middle term will be negative 48x. So it'll be negative 48 squared, negative 48x squared. And then uh, this will be positive 4x squared, which is be positive 4x cubed. There. So that is the volume function uh, for this box. Now, let's talk about the domain of this function. Now, keep in mind that the sides of the sheet are only 12 inches long. So you can still see my diagram. This is only 12 inches. So the longest, um, the longest that the, the, that X can be, right, is six inches. Because if X is actually six, look at what you get, 12 minus uh, two times x times uh, x, which is two times six, and that'll be twelve minus twelve, which would be zero. So, um, anything greater than six, if you plug it in here, this dimension here will be negative, which doesn't make any sense. So, the greatest that x could be is six. Um. And of course, x cannot be anything negative, um, anything less than zero, because that dimension would not make sense for x, right? This dimension right here, which represent the height of our box, doesn't make sense for it to be uh, negative. So I am suggesting that the domain for our function, this volume function, is between zero and six. Right, it cannot be any less than zero, or else this dimension's negative. It can't be any greater than six, or else this dimension right here, uh, which is the length and the width, would be negative. All right, very good. I suggest what we do next um, is find the derivative of our volume function. Now, in this problem, we want to hold as we want this box to hold as much as possible. So we're looking for a maximum. All right, let's find the first derivative for so f, not f. Excuse, I'm used to saying f all the time. V prime of x will be equal to one forty four minus um, ninety six x. Uh, plus 12x squared. Now, this is a polynomial function, so the only critical points will occur when v prime of x is equal to 0. That is to say, when 144 minus 96x plus 12x squared is equal to 0. Uh, let's rewrite that in uh, descending power order. So 12x squared minus 96x plus 144, 
is equal to 0. Let's factor out a 12. And that leaves us with x squared minus 8x plus 12 is equal to 0. And let's continue to factor. So then this is x minus um, 6, x minus 2 is equal to 0. Set each factor equal to 0 and solve. And you get x is either equal to 6 or x is equal to 2. Now, 6 is an endpoint. Um, you know, your other endpoint of your domain is right here. Your other endpoint is 0. Okay. What we want to do is we want to evaluate um, our function um, at the endpoint, so at 0 and at 6, and at any critical points. And so the um, 2 is really your only critical point because 6 is not an interior point. It's an endpoint. All right, so what we're going to do now is evaluate our function, v, at each one of our um, points. So at, oops, sorry, at our left endpoint, which is 0. Um, and remember our, our volume function, if I can find it, there it is. Um, and you may want to um, plug these values in the factored form. I mean, because I can see right away when you plug in 0, uh, 0 times whatever is 0. So v of 0 is going to be 0. You can see that also right here. Um, so let's do that. So v of 0 is equal to 0. Uh, and then v of 2. Now this is a critical point. And when you plug 2 into your function, I think it will be easier to plug it in right here. It'll be 2 times. And then uh, 2 times 2, of course, is 4. 12 minus 4 is 8. And 8 squared is 64. So it'll be 64 times 2, which is 128. Um, then at the right end point, V of 6. And you'll find that v of 6 is also equal to 0. So look at these three function values. You can see that 128 is clearly the largest value. So therefore, this is, now remember, this is the output of your volume function. So this number represents the volume. So the maximum volume is 128 cubic inches. Okay, And 2 represents x. And in our diagram, if you'll allow me to... I hope I'm not getting you dizzy here. X represents the dimensions of these um, the dimensions of these squares that we're cutting out. So because X is two, we're saying that these squares should be two inches on each side, right? So I can say something like that down here to answer the question. All right, very good. This problem is um, done. It was our first optimization problem. I hope you enjoyed it. I like our next problem. It says, you have been asked to design a one liter can shaped uh, like a right circular cylinder. What dimensions will use the least material? All right, so let's draw a quick little picture here. Nothing too fancy. All right, so this is our cylinder. All right, so this is our the height of the cylinder. Right? Um, get that labeled for us. So H for height. And uh, let's see, the radius. This is a circular cylinder so then this would represent the radius let me move that just a little bit there we go so we have um this is our the can now uh keep in mind one equivalence that we may want to remember is that one liter is equal to a thousand cubic uh centimeters okay 
So that's going to be important. So um, maybe what we can do is we can have R and H be measured in centimeters. Okay. All right. So what we want to do is, you know, the, the, the volume of this can is one liter. That is to say the volume of this can is a thousand cubic centimeters. Remember the formula for the volume of a can like this uh, would be pi r squared. Um, pi r squared is the, the formula for the area of a circle. So pi r squared times h, right? So basically h many pi r squareds, right? So the volume is pi r squared h. That is to say a thousand cubic centimeters is equal to pi r squared h. All right, so you may want to um, keep this handy. So we, what we can say, we can simplify this a little bit. Pi r squared h is just equal to 1,000. Okay, so I think we're going to come back to this in just a second. So let's just move this aside. Let's just highlight it and maybe we'll come back to it. This is going to be called like our constraint or constraint equation. Okay, so um, let's talk about we're creating, we're designing this can. So we want to use the least amount of material creating this can. Well, let's think about the material um, needed to create this can. First of all, you the top is a circle. The bottom is a circle. So that's pi r squared right, is that area, another pi r squared, so that's um, 2 pi r squared, right, and then as far as all of this space here, which is the out, the, the like the wall of the can, if you will, uh, 2 pi r, 2 pi r is the circumference of a circle, circumference times h, let me write that down, All right, so here we go. So you have two of these, that's for the top and the bottom of the can, and then two pi r, which is what I was mentioning, is the circumference, so like from this point all the way around the can, times h. Um, so this is the surface area of the can. Now, what we want to do is, what we can do is we can write this, um, let me move this up just a little bit. So what we can do is we can say the surface area, we can let A be area, is equal to this. Now, I want only one variable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this constraint equation and solve for one of the variables. Now, pi is not a variable. It's a constant. So the variables are R and H. Solve for whatever variable is most convenient. In this case, R is being squared. So it would be easiest to solve for H. So let me come over here. So that can be rewritten to say that H is equal to a thousand divided by pi R squared. And what I can do is I can make a substitution right here. Replace this H with this expression. Okay. And then everything will be in terms of R, which is really good, right? So then area would be 2, oops, 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r. Here's the substitution, a thousand over pi r squared. And of course, we can simplify. So the area, the surface area is 2 pi r squared plus um, this pi divides out with pi, and r divides out with one of those r's, so then we are left with uh, 2,000 over r. All right, very good. All right, so we want to minimize this function, right? We want to use the least amount of material possible, so... Um, we're looking for a minimum. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to differentiate. We're going to have to find a prime. So let's do that now. All right. That's good there. All right. So let's do it, folks. 
So a prime, right? We're looking for the derivative of the surface area with respect to um, r. So another way you could have written this is the derivative of the surface area with respect to r. I'm just going to write a prime, okay? But it could be replaced with this notation. So here we go. So a prime is equal to, now 2 pi is just your coefficient. So by the power rule, 2 will come down, and that'll make this 4 pi r. And then plus, now um, this r here, here I'll rewrite it. Um, this term right here, that term right there, can be rewritten as 200 times, no that's 2000, isn't it? 2000 um, r to the negative first. So then by the power rule, the negative one comes down, making this negative 2000 here. That makes this plus sign a minus. Let's make it a minus. So minus 2000, and then it'll be r to the negative second. All right, so let's simplify a little bit here. So I can rewrite this as 4 pi r minus 2,000 over r squared. All right, very good. Now, um, if you want, you can get common denominators. You can, you can rewrite this as a prime is equal to 4 pi r squared minus 2,000 all over um, r squared. And I made a mistake. Actually, this, this would be r cubed because you need to multiply this first term by one in the form of r squared over r squared. So then this would be r cubed. Let's change that real quick. There. And so a prime can be rewritten as four times uh, pi r cubed minus uh, 500 all over r squared. Okay, folks, cool. So you could have left your function like this here. Um, I'll maybe put a star next to this. Maybe you left it like that, which is fine. Or you can rewrite it like this. Sometimes... Um, I don't know. It just depends on what book you're reading, um, on whether they leave it like this or they write it like this here. All right. Very good, folks. Um, what we want to do next is find the critical points. Now, um, our function a, let me go back up here. The fun here it is. This a here, this is the surface area function. Um, this function here it is. This is what I wanted to show you right here. This function is dif differentiable um, on, on r greater than zero. So r, remember, is the radius of our can. And so r has to be positive, right? Something greater than zero. And so uh, this is going to be differentiable on uh, the interval r greater than zero. So therefore... The only critical point for a prime will be when a prime is equal to zero. So that's why you're going to see me set a prime. I want to set this equal to zero. Well, that means 4 pi r minus 200. I guess I'm using this, um, this uh, interpretation of of the derivative. So I'm setting this equal to zero. I think that's probably going to be easier for me than setting this whole expression equal to zero. All right, so let's do it. Let's find out when my critical points or where they're located. So that would mean, oops, that would mean 4 pi r is equal to 2000 over r squared, which is equivalent to saying 4 pi r cubed is equal to 2,000, or r cubed is equal to 
2,000 divided by 4 is 500. Uh, so this will be 500 over pi. That is to say, your one and only critical point is the cube root of 500 over pi. Now, the question is, what is this value for r? Is it an absolute minimum? How do we know? Well, one thing you could do is use the second derivative. I'm scrolling back up so that we can see the first derivative here. You know what? I'm going to get rid of, um, if I can, I just really want you to focus on this um, expression for the first derivative, okay? So what, what we can do is we can use the second derivative now to show that our function will always be concave up, okay? Everywhere, concave up, proving that this value that we found for r down here is a an absolute minimum, all right? So if this is a prime, what is a double prime? So I'm coming back up here just so that we can see what is a double prime. All right, so it'll be 4 pi minus, um, it'll be actually turn out to be plus um, because this here, that term, remember, can be rewritten as 2,000 r to the negative second. So by the power rule, the negative 2 would come down making this negative 4,000. But this negative that's out front already makes it a positive. So positive 4,000 and then r to the negative third. That is to say a double prime is equal to 4 pi plus 4,000 over r cubed. That's a double prime. Now let's consider the sign of a double prime. Now, we're not going to plug in anything negative for for r because that wouldn't make sense right um, because r represents the radius of our can so the only kind of values that you're plugging in for r are positive values so no matter what positive real number you plug in for r this entire function the second derivative function will be positive all right so because it's concave up everywhere um and we know that's because a double prime will always be positive um, we know that this value for r that we found down here, there it is, this value of r is an absolute minimum. Now, what do we still need? Oh, we need the, we need h. We need to find the corresponding h value. Now, remember from earlier, we have this constraint equation that h is a thousand over pi r squared. Remember we saw that earlier, like in the beginning? Um, so that means h is equal to 1,000 over pi times the cube root of 500 over pi squared. Okay? Now, um, what's really interesting is this value of r is approximately uh, 5.42. And this value for h is approximately 10.84. Notice that this value for h is about twice the value for, for the radius. So the radius is about 5.42 centimeters and the height is about 10.84 centimeters. Now those are approximations. So these dimensions would use the least amount of material as possible for our can. Very good. So we optimize our function. Cool.